weekend, I was hoping to get through Revelation 11 in one sermon last week, and I was hoping to get through it in two this week, so it'll be next week before I finish. Uh, there's just so much that we have to, to gain from hearing these words. And, and what I want to do is where it talks about we no longer need to fear because we are children of God. We're going to talk about the two witnesses today, and you'll hear me interchangeably calling them the two prophets, because that really is their office, that is what they do. But it is my prayer that we will all become like them, that we will be fearless as they were fearless. Even in facing death, they were fearless. So we're going to learn some things from them today, and I hope that you'll come along for the journey and enjoy what you gain and apply it, not just enjoy it intellectually, not just receive it in your heart and say that really helps me to understand, but that you will take it to your hearts and say, I will become this with the help of God. Amen? Amen. So Revelation 11, we're going to go verses uh, 7 through 14, and I would like to read it in its entirety in that part, and then I'm going to backtrack just a little bit to bring us up to speed from what we had last week. So starting in Revelation chapter 11, verse 7, when they finished their testimony, speaking of the two witnesses, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So we know it's the city of Jerusalem. Then those from the people's tribes... <clears throat> Tongues and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, making merry, sending gifts to one another, because these two prophets, there we go, witnesses and prophets, tormented those who dwell on the earth. Verse 11, now after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them. And they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. So what we're going to do here is go backtrack just a little bit and talk just in brief about the, the two witnesses, the two prophets, as I spoke of them last week. So that we catch anybody who didn't get to be here last week, they'll be up to speed with us. The first thing we learn about these two witnesses, or these two prophets, is that they are basically the final word to the mankind. They're the final human word. We know later that there's an angel that flies over the heavens and declaring the gospel of Christ. But this is an earthly being. These two men represent God's witness upon the earth, and God always leaves himself a witness. We read that in the book of Acts. I believe it to be chapter 5. There is always a witness. God never leaves himself without a witness, and that witness always brings forth the word. If you remember last week, I talked to you a little bit about the message of the witnesses, and I felt it might be along the line of Stephen, one of the martyrs, who recounted holy history and then brought it forward into the New Testament, into the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, his ascension, and so on. And we all got wound up on that one. That was good. So that's what I think is happening. These witnesses are bringing forth the word of God. They're giving the testimony of God, and they're telling the world one last and final time, God is who he is. God has said he will do what he will do. And we are here to warn you as well as to welcome those who will come into the kingdom of God. So these are these two great witnesses or these two great prophets. Now we know also that their message is pretty difficult because they are dressed in sackcloth. Sackcloth was the dress for the prophets when they came to bring messages of mourning, of judgment, and of warning. So from that description, we know that these guys are ready to rock and roll for Jesus Christ. They're saying, lock and load, folks, because we're going to tell you now what the end is about to be. Part of why Revelation 11 is so important, it is a transitional passage in the whole book of Revelation, which brings us to the final culmination of human history as we know it today, and brings forth the kingdom of God that we are all hoping for. Amen? Amen. I hope you're hoping for the kingdom of God. You know, we get so used to this world and so used to living in these bodies as they are today and with sin and the curse and the sickness, all the different things and the disease and the wars, 
we begin to think that there's not anything much better. There's a whole lot better coming, and we need to rejoice in that. Turn to somebody and say, a lot better is coming. So these two witnesses have come, and they're telling all everybody all of these truths, both the good and the bad and the ugly, the negative and the positive, the, the worldly and the godly. They're setting these things out separately so people can see where they are. And they come, as it were, in the likeness of Joshua and Zerubbabel, the olive trees and, and the lampstands in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. Remember, we quoted that last week, that not by might nor power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. These two men, these two witnesses, these two prophets will be men absolutely filled with the Holy Spirit. And when they speak, they speak truth with great power and anointing that no one can sensibly, spiritually deny. They also come in the anointing of the Holy Spirit with signs and wonders and miracles and the ability to change nature as they choose. We talked about how they were men of God, and it says, and we read over it quickly, that if anyone came to attack them, that a fire would come out of their mouths and these people would be burned up, would be killed. Now, some people like to interpret that and say, well, that's just a, a kind of a, an idea. It's not really that. I believe it's really that. I think it can be both. I believe, I looked at the word in the Greek for fire uh, over the last few days, and the word fire here means fire. And it also means the fire that talks of God in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, that says that God is a holy fire, and he consumes things that are all around him. And so I believe that people come at these guys will speak the word of God with power to defend themselves. More or less in the idea, in the name of Jesus Christ, I bind you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I strike you. Whatever they choose to do, they're going to be powerful men. But not power of the flesh, power of the spirit. And I believe people are going to really get whacked. I think they're going to actually collapse under whatever this is and however it manifests itself. They're going to be those kinds of individuals. They're going to be scary. Turn to somebody and say, they're going to be scary. They're going to be able to take nature and do with it as they choose. The scripture we read about them says that they could stop the rain whenever they chose. They could turn water, the water that existed already, turn it to blood whenever they chose. It says whenever they decided to, they could bring all the plagues that were mentioned in, in uh, the book of Egypt, in the, in the story of Egypt and getting out of there, in the book of Exodus. That whole thing says they can do all of this. And so they're going to speak. People are not going to like what they speak. And then they're going to say, well, you just prove yourself. They say, okay, no rain. Oh, blood. You know, they're going to be able to do this with just one simple word because they are in connection with God the Father. They are in connection with him through the Holy Spirit, which gives them the power to accomplish whatever it is that God sets in them to accomplish. Now, what's the lesson from this? The lesson often is seen as, ooh, okay? That's okay. The world's going to do that. But the lesson is for us that we, too, need, essentially, the Holy Spirit. I don't think that God is coming for a church that is impotent, and, and, and unable to accomplish the task. God is coming for a church that is filled with his presence and manifests his power. Will we be doing those kinds of miracles? I don't really know. I don't really think so. But I do know that without the Holy Spirit, we cannot live a proper testimony. And that's what we're looking at here. We want to be able to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Paul writes to us that do not be drunk with wine, which is a dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And with that word be filled, he means continually be being filled. Saints, I speak to us today. If you're an unbeliever here today, this makes no sense to you yet. It might if you get saved. But to the saint, we are to be pursuing the presence and the, the uh, anointing of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need to be pursuing God through the word, through worship, through fellowship, through service, and asking and begging God who wants to give to us good gifts to empower us with the Holy Spirit. The apostle, or the, the writer Luke, writes to us and says, that the Holy Spirit, God will give, how much more will God give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You'll find that in Luke, I think, chapter 11. I'm kind of on the wing here at the moment. But we need the Holy Spirit. Turn to somebody and say, we need the Holy Spirit. And you see, if you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit. 
But I think that many of us as believers in Jesus Christ often allow the Holy Spirit to be in us but to remain dormant. We do not allow him the liberty that he wants and the liberty that he needs to break forth from us as our humanity and to express himself in that capacity which leads other to Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit is about. He is always to exalt Jesus Christ. And you cannot do that effectively in just the flesh. You cannot do it effectively with just your brains. You cannot do it effectively with just your emotions. You know, people, if they get you into the somewhere with Christ over an emotional commitment, a few minutes later, that may be gone. Somebody who can argue with you into the kingdom or near the kingdom in the intellect, another person with intellect can come and argue you out. It's the Holy Spirit that brings us to Christ. It's the Holy Spirit that seals us in our Savior. And that's what we learn from these witnesses. They are powerful men, but it's not about their power. It's about the Spirit of God moving in them. They are one more testimony to us that the Spirit of God is essential in the Christian. That we are not just to be Spirit born again, we are to be Spirit filled. That the Spirit of God finds a vessel in each of us in which He may dwell and out of which he may flow. And that means that we must know the word. We must take time in prayer. We must take time in fellowship with him. We must seek to rid ourselves of any weight and sin which holds us back from our relationship with the Father. That's what we need to do. So that's the first lesson today, lesson one, that we be a people who understand the essential nature and necessity of the Holy Spirit in us. Now it goes on, verse seven through eight, it says this, When they finish their testimony, these two prophets, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord Jesus was crucified. Now, this is an interesting passage. It says, when their testimony is finished. The word there for finish is got the same root to it as the word it is finished when Jesus died on the cross. The Greek word there is tetelestai. In this passage, its ending is a little bit different. I won't even try to say it. But what it means is is that the testimony not only of these witnesses is finished, but I believe it means that the testimony of God is utterly complete. They have done what they are to do. They are the last and final word of man to mankind that God uses in this earth. And they're saying, okay, you heard it. For three and a half years we have stood here. The evil one, the satanic leader of the world, cannot harm us until the day that God allows him to do so. And we have finished. The message is complete. The warning is complete. Everything that needs to be said, everything that needs to be done has been put in order and we are finished. They don't mean that negatively. They're just simply saying, the time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. And they've told the whole world with their voices, with the word of God, with signs and wonders and miracles, and with the capacity to resist the evil one. So there's something that we learn from this. We learn that we too have a testimony. What is your testimony individually? And have you done it to the top part of your capacity? What is the testimony of your pastor? What is the testimony of this church? What is it that's spoken of by us out there? What is it that is spoken of about us in our world today? Are we known as a people of God or just a Christian club? How do people know who we are, what we are, what we believe, and and what we are striving to accomplish? So the beast then comes at this point where they say their testimony is finished. Their, Their ministry is done. So now they can go home. And God allows the evil one, the beast, the Antichrist to come to make war on them and to kill them. He kills them because he hates them. We need to understand that, saints. There's a lot of churches that are selling out today. They're trying to reach anybody they can, any way they can, by compromising their faith, compromising the way they look, compromising so many things, compromising the word, frankly, compromising Jesus Christ. 
I'll be frank and honest about that. And they don't want anybody to dislike them. Guess what? The world hates us. It's okay. Jesus tells us in John chapter 15, verse 18 through 20, that if the world hates me, they're going to hate you. If the world persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. It's okay. It's perfectly fine. Acts chapter 5, verse 41, we see that the, the apostles were arrested and, and they were treated poorly. And then they get out of prison and it says they rejoice because they had been counted worthy to suffer for the kingdom of God, for the name of Jesus Christ. That's the mentality that we need to be developing. Amen. We need to live it as adults and we need to teach it to our children. We need to say, hey, don't follow the world. Be an individual, follow Jesus Christ. And yes, you're going to pay a price for following him. Isn't it wonderful? That's, a good, that's, good. that's the way it should be. There's a lawsuit taking place right now. I can't remember the city. I didn't mean to share this in the first service, but I did, so I'll share it now. But I really can't remember it. Somebody else may be able to tell you. A little girl in the second grade, I think, maybe the third grade, in a public school, kneel, uh, uh, bowed her head and thanked God for her lunch. And there's a lawsuit against her family because she proclaimed her faith. She prayed silently to thank Jesus Christ for her lunch. And she is being persecuted. It's happening all over. We know about the bakers and cooking their, their cakes or not cooking cakes for certain groups because they don't hold to their religious or their moral view. That's all right. It's okay. They're wiping some of these people out financially with all of their bills for legal services and so on. But the reality is we still need somehow in all of that to rejoice and say, thank you, God, that my testimony was sufficient that the world could see me and hate me enough to persecute me. You see, the world loves it when the church just sits down and shuts up. They just love that because they can walk all over us. They've been walking all over us for a long time. It's time for us as a people to rise up. And it's happening. And we're seeing the persecutions increase. People are saying no to these things. We're, we're speaking out against social issues of the day. We're being very open and frank about abortion, about a lot of other issues that are out there. And the world hates it. What do you expect? That's the way it's supposed to be. There is a difference between darkness and light. How many of you have ever lived in roach country? Okay. I've lived where there's lots of roaches. I grew up in Texas. We lived in Africa. I tell you, you go out of your room in, in uh, uh, Africa at nighttime. There's no lights on and you carry a flashlight. And you put the flashlight on the ground. And we're not talking two or three. We're talking hundreds of roaches, and you're walking along in the dark, and <laughs> the world is under your feet. <laughs> Satan is under your feet. Amen? Amen? He really is. But you've got to believe it. And you have to realize that at times, he can overcome you. He kills these witnesses. And it looks a little bit like a victory for a while, doesn't it? God allows that, but God has the final word. God does the final deed. God takes care of all things and makes all things right. He evens the score, but he can't even the score through people who will not live for Jesus Christ. We've got to be that people who say, my testimony is important. And you see, these witnesses countered everything that the devil said. The devil came in, he overpromised and underdelivered. I'm going to give you peace and safety, but that's not what happened. It didn't happen. Every time he makes a prediction is what I believe. This is a speculative thought on my part. But every time he makes a prediction and makes some godless statement, the, the, the prophets, the witnesses say, oh, by the way, here's what God says. And by the way, he wants to fight and scream and yell about it. That's just fine. And if you agree with him, let me tell you what, we're just going to cut off the spigot for a while. You watch and see. We're going to tell you that it's not going to rain between uh, February of such and such a year to mm, February of the next year. They have that power. And it's going to make him angry. He's going to, he's going to be consolidating his power. He's going to hold it under like, well, and, you know, they're just religious kooks. But he hates them. And you know, when they hate us, they just think we're religious kooks. Praise God. They want to marginalize us and keep us out of the social realm, out of the spiritual realm, because we, if we are in the Spirit of God with the Word of God, have power to do all kinds of things. Amen? Amen. 
Try it on the voting booth and see what happens. Just give it a shot and see what God will do. So then he attacks them. <coughs> He's able to defeat them. And he kills them and he leaves their bodies in the streets. They won't let them be buried. And the word that they use for bodies in the English is not the word that's used in the Greek. The word used in the Greek means carcass. It's like dead animals that they've killed and laid in the street. And they will not allow anybody, even the decency, to bury them. Now, I think there's a reason. I think in the Antichrist's mind is, hmm, I'm going to show the world. These guys are going to rot in that street. And I'm going to prove as the Antichrist that I had power to kill these men. And all of you are going to look to me and think, wow, he really has power. I think there's another aspect of it, too. I think he's going to say, they've talked about the resurrection, and I suspect they will. I think they're going to talk about the resurrection of the body. They may even prophesy what's going to happen to them. And he's going to prove, he's going to prove that they won't raise from the dead. Oops. <laughs> Isn't going to happen, is it? There's another aspect to it, too, which I think is the God side. And God is saying, go ahead. Put them out there in the street. Come on, bring on in CNN. MSNBC, Fox News. Come on, let them focus those cameras in 24 hours a day. Put out the lights and everything. Show the big beams so everybody can see these bodies are just rotting and there's flies crawling all over them. You know, maggots beginning to form. They're beginning to decay. And everybody's going to see it when it happens. It's going to look like victory. But it's going to be defeat. That's what's going to happen. And so, second lesson. Remember the world hates you so much that they will give you no respect. They do not respect you. And so these carcasses are left there, these poor bodies are left there. And then it says that the world begins to celebrate. I won't read it because I'm gonna run out of time. But it talks about that they begin to celebrate the death of these two prophets. They were angry at them because they tormented them night and day for three and a half years. Wouldn't you love to have that kind of power? But anyway, <laughs> be that as it may, they're sending gifts to each other. It's like Christmas all over again. Yippee, we've won. Doesn't work out so well. Because at the end of the three and a half days, these people that they hated, these people that were murdered, these people who are not even given a burial, it says the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God himself entered them. Look at that in verse 11. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them. Just like it entered Adam, just like it entered Jesus, it enters them. And they stand up on their feet. Can you imagine? Everybody's saying, hoo, 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 cut, 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 blackout. You know, <laughs> it'll be too late because they're not expecting it. The whole world somehow, and I think it'll be through technology, but whatever it is, the whole world will see these men stand up on their feet feet. They will also see them ascend to God the Father. And I think they'll even hear the voice of God say, come up here. Now we've got the witness of the witnesses. We have the witness of the resurrection. We have the witness of the Father. And the world is going to be absolutely devastated. They are not going to believe their eyes. They are going to be astounded. But it's going to happen. And that to me is important for us to understand. The next lesson is, do we believe what we say we believe? Do we believe there is another life following this one? Do we believe that when we close our eyes in death, we open them in the presence of Jesus Christ and that we no longer have to fear death? Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Where is thy sting, O death? It has been swallowed up in victory. Amen. Man, that day is going to be life. And those men will rise. And Satan is going to be pulling out his hair. He is going to be so angry. He's going to be, have such hatred. You'll see in the next two chapters now how that anger is released because he knows. He knows he's defeated. He is the author of death, Apollyon, the destroyer, and he cannot destroy the people of God. Amen. 
We need to hold on to that, saints. We need to toughen up. We need to be able to understand that there's a battle on and we're part of it. We're privileged to be in the battle. Even if we are killed in the battle, it is a privilege because death has no hold on any of us. Amen? Amen. This only comes as we possess the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to possess us. It only comes when we understand the necessity of the Spirit and the power of a testimony that says to people, we are not afraid, we are not ashamed, we will not relent. We will be the light to the world. We will allow the Spirit of God to move us. And when it looks to you, world, as though you've had a victory, we tell you, it is your defeat. Remember the story of Wombrand? A man put a pistol right at his head. He says, do you not know that I have the power to kill you? And Brother Wombrand said, do you not know I have the power to die? That man was scared to death. He wouldn't deal with Wombrand anymore after that because he couldn't frighten Wombrand. And now he's beginning to understand why. Because Wombrand said, I can die at peace because in a split second, I will be with my Jesus. Do you have a faith like that? Do you want a faith like that? Do you need one? Yes, you do. We all need such faith. They'll be raised from the dead. The world will see it. The earth will quake. A localized earthquake around Jerusalem. It says a tenth of the city will fall. And then it says it's an idiom. It's a Jewish idiom that 7,000 will perish. It's an idiom. So it may be more than 7,000 people. And it says, fear will come upon all, and many will glorify God. You see, God, when he moves, and when he overcomes the enemy, even those who once were enemies may, in fact, say, I give up. I give up. Okay, God, you win. I want you as my Savior. That's really important. And so these lessons for us today, know the Holy Spirit, walk in the testimony of your word with the power of the Holy Spirit. Know that the evil one and all who are of him will hate you. Know that you may lose the battle, but you will win the victory. You will win. And then finally understand that God's pushing all of this, all of these things, not just to condemn and to bring his wrath, but to bring some to salvation. And on that day when the Jerusalem shakes, remember Jerusalem shook before, it shook when Jesus died, and it shook when he rose again. Those were moments of decision for people. Great moments of decision. And that's when people would say, I give up God. Okay, you win. I need you to be my Savior. That's all right to have that motivation. You know, a lot of people, we well, need to love God when you come into the kingdom. No, you just need to know God. You need to honor him for who he is. He's big. God can be mean and tough. We got all this ooey gooey, God loves you. Yes, he does. But he is also a holy and righteous God that cannot accept sin. He cannot. And yet he sets himself before us in his son, Jesus Christ. And he says, won't you just give in? Won't you just give up your way and come to me? I'll give you a new way. It'll be a way that brings you into my presence, which is more wealth in the things of spirit and life than you can even imagine. That's what God offers. That's what Revelation is teaching us. There is something more coming. And we need to be ready for that by putting our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for this day, and I pray if there be anybody in this place today that has never said, okay, God, I give in. I pray they just give in right now. And say, Lord, I can't win against you. It's not possible. And I'm ready to quit fighting. I'm ready to quit running. I'm ready to quit resisting you. And I just give myself to you. That's what I want for people today, Lord. And that can happen even for the Christian. That we would say in our hearts, Lord, I've, I've been resisting you. Forgive me. Bring me back into fellowship with you. That's what we want, Lord. So I just pray there's anybody here today who would make that decision, that they would make it known 
They just raise their hand and we'll pray together. I'll track them down afterwards and just pray with them. I see one. Anyone else? Tired of running. Tired of battling God. There's another one, number two. Anybody else? Just that you're sick of the whole thing. Running your own life. Let God run it. There's the third one. Just let God have it. He'll take it. He, he wants to take it. He loves to take our garbage and give us his glory. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for these three who've raised their hand today. I ask in Jesus' name that you would answer their prayer. You've seen their hearts. They don't need me involved, although if they would, I will do that. They just need you. And if you've seen their hand raised, Lord, you promise that you will answer. And I believe you will do that. To these two men and this young woman, Lord, grant to them your presence. Bring them into the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Help them to walk in a way that they have a good testimony and to have courage to live and if so, to die in and for Jesus Christ. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Go live like you mean it. <laughs>